Good afternoon and Merry Christmas. Welcome to Faith. We're glad to have you with us today on a special Christmas Eve service. Uh, we're going to be together for about an hour, so uh, we're going to have some time of singing. Uh, the kids' choir is going to be singing a song as well, and then Matthew will be coming to share an exciting message from God's Word, celebrating uh, Jesus today as we come together. Uh, the video you just saw, you may not have heard it real well, but uh, starting in the week of January 12th is a group that we call Starting Point. So if you're uh, just checking out faith and found, figuring out what God is, who he is, and what he's all about, um, or maybe you grew up going to church but have been away for a while, Starting Point is a great opportunity for you uh, to jump in. It's a judgment-free zone where you can get questions about faith answered in a very comfortable atmosphere. So I want to invite you to that the week of January 12th. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. We are glad you're here, and I hope that uh, your Christmas Eve has gotten off to a great start, and you're here to enjoy and celebrate with us as we remember the birth of Jesus Christ. So let's stand as we sing, harp the herald angels sing, and echo what the angels began singing thousands of years ago. Let's sing.
Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come. You may be seated. We have got a special treat in store for you guys tonight. As Dave mentioned, we have a children's choir coming up to sing. These are the kids that are a part of our kids club that uh, takes place every Sunday morning uh, at both our 9.30, or our 9 and 10.30 service. You guys can come right on up here. And uh, so they're here to lead you in singing. They're not just going to sing for you. They want to lead you in singing. So they're going to sing away in a manger. The words will be up there on the screen. And so as they get us started, let's sing along with them. Give them a second and they will be ready. Thank you guys, you did an excellent job. Part of me wants to have him just do the rest of the service, right? All right, we're gonna continue on in our worship this evening. We are, we're excited. We, it's time we get to, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And these guys, we don't know if there was three of them. We don't know if there was 300 of them. There could have been any number of them. We know they had three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they came not to the manger, but a little bit later. And they came because they wanted to give Jesus their best. They wanted to come and worship him with what they had. And they encourage us to do the same, to come give Jesus the best that we have, to worship him with what we have. And we're going to sing a little bit about them tonight, and then we're going to talk about them a little bit later. So let's stand again as we continue on in our worship this evening. <laughs> Speech. 
this uh, month of December, we have been taking time to remember what Christmas is all about. There was a line in the chorus there, guiding us to that perfect light. And that light is Jesus. And when Jesus came, he came to remind us of who he is. He came to remind us that he is the hope of the world. That there is nothing else that can bring us hope other than him. He came not out of obligation, but out of love. Love for you, love for me, love for mankind. He came to bring peace, not to destroy, but to bring peace. All of our fears and our anxieties are washed away because of Jesus. And he came bringing joy. He came to bring us lasting joy. Not that kind of joy that we get from, you know, our favorite food or our favorite team winning the game, but joy that's lasting. And all of that reminds us that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and it's him that we worship tonight. It's him that we celebrate. He is that perfect light, that light that shines brightly in the darkness so that all may see and all may know his love, his hope, his peace, and his joy.
son, Jesus, to be born of Mary so that we may have life everlasting. God, it's you we worship tonight. It's you we praise. And we pray that as we go through the rest of today and tomorrow, that we will remember that we celebrate at this time because of you and what you have given us, the greatest gift anyone could ever give. It's your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Good to have all of you here together with us. And in the stillness of this Christmas Eve 2019, I'd like us just to step back and pause and just take a moment to ask a question. A very important question. A question that with all the busyness of life and all the hustle and bustle with this time of the year, it might be a question that we try to drown out or push aside. Or maybe it's a question we really haven't given much thought to. But a question nonetheless that has the incredible power to give us direction in our lives. To fill us with hope. To really transform the trajectory of our lives. And here's the question I'd like you, just in the quietness of your own mind, to ask yourself. And it's this. What am I searching for in life? Whether we acknowledge or not, as someone has put it, everyone is looking for something. What is that for you? Maybe the question would be, what gives my life meaning and purpose? What brings ultimate fulfillment to my life? What am I searching for? Uh, maybe it, it's hope, love, joy, peace. I would assume that deep down in, all of us want those things in our lives, don't we? Sure we do. But, but where do we find those things in this life? I'm so glad that you joined us here on this Christmas Eve. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, maybe you just came, you're checking things out, maybe you're just being polite to a friend. I'm glad you're with us because I believe that there's a special message for all of us here. Because when Jesus was born, He came to give us, every single one of us, hope and love and joy and peace. He came to demonstrate the greatest love that there ever could be to lay down His life. He came to grant us true peace. Peace with God. Peace with others. Peace within. He came to fill us, not with temporary happiness, but with complete joy. You know, as I, I look around the world today, and I look at what people put all of their time and resources and energies into, I wonder if they really are finding what they're looking for. I've seen people that have it all. They, they have riches, they have power, they have fame, and yet they seem empty. I've 
I've observed those who have given up on the search. They've tried various means and looking and they just can't find it. And I've also observed those who have very little and, and yet are filled with joy and contentment and you can take any number of things in between all those too, right? And so this evening, I'd like us just to pause for some brief moments and look at a, a few unique characters known to us as the wise men that come onto the scene of the Christmas story and look at their search and maybe through their search, we can find what we're looking for. Matthew is the follower of Jesus that records the story about the, the wise men. Matthew actually was a tax collector. He wasn't very liked in society as a tax collector, as you can imagine. And yet Jesus came into his life and changed everything for him. And he records to us, for us, how these wise men followed a star that led them to the Christ child born in Bethlehem. So the, this evening, I'd like to ask the question, first of all, who were these wise men and what were they searching for? The original word that's used of these wise men actually is the word magi. And there's all sorts of ideas about who they were. We even sang a song about them tonight. Popular traditions portray the wise men as three in number, and that probably came about due to the three types of gifts that they brought. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as kings, but they really weren't kings. Later traditions even gave them names, such as Caspar and Melchior and Balthazar. But none of those descriptions actually come from the Bible. Most likely, believe it or not, they were pagan priests from the east. Specifically from a, an area called Arabia. And that would today include Iraq and Saudi Arabia, though, that area. They were a cast of wise men who, who specialized in astronomy and astrology and science. It's interesting because, uh, and you can go and look at this on your own, but in the book of Daniel, the wise men are mentioned. Not the wise men that came at the birth of Jesus, but back in the history of Babylon, there are a group of advisors to the king that were called the Magi. The wise men. So I'd like to just briefly read and look at what Matthew says. And if you want to check it out for yourself and see if I'm actually reading what's right here, we do have a Bible in the chair in front of you, and you can find it on page 895, or you can just look up here on the screen. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judah, of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east, came to Jerusalem saying, Where is He born King of the Jews? For we saw His star when it rose, and we have come to worship Him. These wise men traveled to Jerusalem from somewhere on the other side of the Arabian desert. They had come many miles in their journey. We don't know how long exactly it took them. But they didn't just wander in or kind of let the wind blow them in. They actually came with intent. They had a purpose. You see, God in His grace had revealed to them His plan. That His Son, Jesus, would be born... And He would be King of the Jews. 
Now, it's interesting because actually I had mentioned Daniel earlier. Back in Daniel 9, it talks about the coming Messiah, and it even gives times of when He would be coming. And in Babylon, if they came from Babylon, they would have had these Scriptures and would have known the timing for this coming Christ, Messiah. And then God led them through a star. And so they came and they were searching for something. They were searching for someone. The newborn king of the Jews. Verse 3 goes on, it says, And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Now, if you know anything about history, there's a good reason that all of Jerusalem was troubled when King Herod was troubled. Because King Herod, Herod the Great, was not a nice guy. He was a paranoid king who, had, who would kill anyone that he saw as a threat to his reign. In fact, history records that he killed his wife and even three of his own sons because he was paranoid that they would kill him or take his reign. Not a nice guy. But he puts on kind of a front for these wise men. Verse 4 goes on, And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's a quote from the prophet Micah. Micah prophesied 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. The specific place that he would be born. Verse 7, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and he ascertained from them what uh, time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Now, he had no intention of worshiping the newborn king. His intention was to kill the newborn king. In fact, we read later, that's exactly what he did. He went out and martyred all the, the boys two years old and younger in the area of Bethlehem, trying to rid himself of this threat. And it goes on, it says this. It says, after listening to the king, they, the wise men, went on their way, and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went up before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down. And what did they do? They worshipped. Then opening their treasures... They offered gifts. Gifts? Of gold? And of frankincense? And of myrrh? And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. I want you just to imagine and picture in your mind this setting from the song we just sang, Silent Night. The bright stars in the sky pointing the wise men to the actual address of the new king. Talk about GPS. That was a nice tracker right there. It may have been a silent night. It certainly was a holy moment for these wise men 
who viewed the one they were searching for and had traveled so many miles to see. There they were in the presence of this newborn king. All was calm. All was bright. Before them was the virgin mother and her child, the holy infant, tender and mild. The wise men came. They came with their gifts. They were gifts fit for royalty. They came to honor and anoint Jesus as King. Now, we do know, even though we sang and we even saw this video, uh, that time had passed from the birth of Jesus. We don't know how much time. It doesn't tell us. Somewhere between His birth and two years old. But they were no longer in a stable. Jesus was no longer in a feeding trough when they came. They were in a house at that point. But it's interesting, they came looking for this newborn king that was called the Christ. Now, we look at that, we say Jesus Christ. We think of that as part of His name, but actually the word Christ is a title not His specific name. And Christ was used also in Luke. Luke's Gospel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's a title. Very interesting. Again, I'm someone who likes history. I like to look at the evidence of what actually took place. And so... Uh, Sometimes I I enjoy looking at evidence outside of Scripture as well. And in the first century, there was a Roman senator named Tacitus. And Tacitus was not a follower of Jesus, but in his writings, he refers to Jesus and calls Him Christus. Christ is the term. He may not have known that Christ is actually a title. And it comes from a word, the root word, which means ointment or salve. It means to to rub on something. And it was used in connection with the coronation of a king. When a king would be anointed. Or a priest would be anointed. And so eventually the word Christ came to mean anointed, and to the Jewish people, it came to mean Messiah. And when a king was set apart, there were gifts that were given, and he was anointed as their king. And here when these wise men bow down before this little baby, and they give their gifts, they are proclaiming him to be One scholar, N.T. Wright, says this, the gifts that the Magi brought were the sort of things that people in the ancient world would think of as appropriate presents to bring kings or even gods. They were very expensive things that they brought. They had great value and they were only used on very special occasions. But not only were they valuable, I believe each of these gifts had special significance as well. The first was gold. Gold was a gift for a king. King Solomon, one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel, amassed incredible amounts of gold. And he says in Psalm 72, he talks about people bringing gifts to the king. Gifts of gold. The child to whom they gave the gift of gold and worshipped as the king, ironically would be asked 33 years later, probably in the same place that the wise men asked, where is he born? King of the Jews? 
was asked in that very same palace by the governor, Pontius Pilate, where is he? By Pontius Pilate in Matthew chapter 27, he's, the governor says to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. Uh, those of you that don't know us, uh, last year the church sent my wife and I over to Israel. And we had a wonderful time there. And I'm a natural skeptic, so seeing the actual places and the archaeology and all of these things was incredible. And one of the highlights we had is we stayed right across the street from this palace, this ancient palace of King Herod, who was probably the very exact place where Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Not only that, after he was condemned to death to die on the cross, they hung a sign over his head. Do you remember what that said? This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Right. Jesus did die. But he didn't stay. If he stayed dead, then what we're doing here tonight is completely worthless. But he didn't stay dead. In fact, Scripture records the very end of the Bible that one day he is going to come back. And it says this, On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Paul... and this is incredible as far as if you're searching and wondering about the truth of Jesus. Paul was someone who hated followers of Jesus. He hunted them down to see them killed. Until one day, Jesus, after having come back from the dead, appeared to him and changed everything that Paul himself became a follower of Jesus and even was martyred for his faith. And he says this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus is the King of kings. You know, I look around the world today and you see it as much as I do. In government and in politics, what do we see? We see a lot of corruption, don't we? We see individuals sometimes who are only interested in power. I'm thankful for the good individuals we have in government because we need more of them. Amen? That's right. I also see incredible justice, injustice around this world. But here's my hope. My hope isn't in human government. My hope is in the King of Kings who will one day come back and will rule in righteousness and in justice. And He will right every wrong. And there will be, as Scripture says, no end to His government. Not only did the Magi bring gold, but they brought frankincense. Frankincense was used in the temple by the priest as a sweet perfume that was offered up to God every morning and evening on what was called the altar of incense. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 30. And the child to whom they offered the gift of frankincense is God incarnate. God in the flesh. We use His name Emmanuel. Emmanuel simply means God with us. John, one of the closest followers of Jesus when He was on this earth, said this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh and dwelt among us? It was Jesus. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
They worshipped Him not only as the King of kings, but Lord of lords as God in the flesh. And then finally, they brought a gift of myrrh. What's interesting about myrrh is myrrh is used for anointing a priest. Again, Exodus 30. Not only was it used for anointing a priest, but it was used to embalm the body of someone who had died. And what's interesting is Jesus came to be our great high priest. To be our mediator and bring us back to God. To show us who God is like. Hebrews 14 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus is our great high priest and no matter what you and I are going through in life, no matter what we face, He's there for us. He is with me. He is for me. He knows what I'm going through. He cares about me. I'm not alone. And He gives me the grace to make it. Christmas is sometimes one of the hardest times of the year for people. Remember, Jesus is our height. And He cares for you. The child to whom the wise men gave the gift of myrrh was not only the high priest, but he would have his body prepared for burial with myrrh because he was going to sacrifice himself for you and me for our sins the things I've done wrong the things you've done wrong the things that separate us from God John records that after Jesus had died Nicodemus who had come to Jesus by night that's John 3 if you want to read that I call him Nick at night but he came and he, he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 70 pounds in weight, so that they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. By the way, those who don't think Jesus died or think that somehow he, he kind of did a Houdini and got out of those linens with almost 100 pounds of spices around him, in the state he was, not happening. Not possible. And then to roll away a stone? A huge stone? Mm -mm. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't stay dead. God raised him from the dead three days later. And he conquered sin and death so he could set you and me free from sin and death. And here's the reason that I believe in Jesus. It's not just because the Bible says so. Here's the reason I believe in Jesus. If someone can predict their death, burial, and resurrection and actually come back from the dead and prove it, guess what? I'm with Him. And there is so much evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that even atheists who were trying to prove it wrong became followers of Jesus after studying it. So let me leave you with this tonight. Because maybe you're searching. Maybe you're searching like the wise men. And if you are, I want to encourage you to be like the wise men. Because the first thing they did, they were wise enough to follow God's leading. His revelation to search out the Scriptures, to follow the star. I don't think it's an accident that you're here tonight. God led you here in your search. 
The second thing, they were wise enough to ask questions and get answers. None of us have all the answers. But we can ask questions and we can search them out. And I would encourage you to get your questions answered. And the third thing, when they got their questions answered and they came face to face with Jesus, they bowed and worshipped. Sure, I still have answer or questions that I, I have. Not all my questions are answered, but I've had and seen enough to know the truth of Jesus Christ. And so I've surrendered my heart and my life to Him. And guess what I get to experience? Hope and love and joy and peace. And you'll never know what I'm talking about until you experience it yourself. So how do you experience that? Well, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Me. Paul makes it clear how to know Jesus. He says this in Romans 10. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, He's God, the Lord of Lords, If you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be what? What does it say? Saved. For with the heart one believes and is declared right, justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is what? Saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will And here's the great part. You don't have to go through me. You don't have to go through someone else. The great part is it's not based on what you do or how good you are or how many times you go to church. It's simply based on, number one, acknowledging that you're not good enough on your own to make it. That you're separated from God because of the things you've done. And guess what? We've all done those things. Second of all, To believe that Jesus is who He said He was. That He is God in the flesh. That He lived and died in your place and my place for our sins. To bring us back to God. And then thirdly, simply call out on Him with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Jesus is. He died. He rose again. And then simply ask Him to save you and forgive you and lead you. And the moment you do that, you become God's forever. And you can have that promised hope and love and joy. And so this Christmas Eve, my hope and prayer is that we will realize with a fresh perspective that Jesus is the Christ. He is the King of kings. That He is God. He is Lord of lords. And that He is our great high who brings us back to God and who actually intercedes on our behalf so that no matter what we're facing, He is there to help us. My prayer is that in Him, you and I this Christmas may have love, hope, love, joy, and peace. Father, thank You for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank You that Jesus is the answer that we're searching. Lord, I pray for those who may not yet be followers of Jesus, that You'd help them get the answers to their questions. And for those of us who are, that that we would bow before You and worship You and, and share Your good news with those around us. In Jesus' name. Passionately and positively, impact our community for Jesus. And so for the month of December, we've been uh, collecting funds 
to help out the Salvation Army here in Cortland. Uh, they're putting together a warming shelter uh, for the homeless here in Cortland. We want to help be a part of that. So um, out here by the, the door and then also in the back by the sound booth, we have a couple of buckets there. If you'd like to give towards that, that's not going to go to us as a church. Uh, all of those money is going to go to the Salvation Army for that. And so uh, feel free on your way out to put a donation in there if you'd like to. Also on the chair in front of you, there's a connection card that looks like this. If you want to fill that out and uh, let us know how we can be praying for you, or if you'd like more information about what Matthew's been talking about this evening, uh, we'd love to talk to you more about that as well. If you don't have a church home, uh, we'd love to have you join us again this Sunday at Faith, uh, 9 o'clock and 10.30 our services. We'll be starting a new series called I'm In, so we invite you to be a part of that. Thank you for coming, and uh, feel free to stick around for as long as you'd like. Thanks. Have a good night.